My name's John Liu. I've just been learning English by listening to the Voice of America on the radio, so perhaps we can have a practice conversation. Um, but that's not really true, because I was, I was born in Nashville, Tennessee, and I grew up in Bloomington, Indiana, but for the last 37 years, I've lived in China. Um, I am the ambassador, ecosystem ambassador for Common Land Foundation. Uh, I have a visiting fellowship at the Netherlands Institute of Ecology. This was a presentation which I gave in, at the European Permaculture Convergence recently. So these were the sponsors in, in, uh, in Italy. Tuscany is very nice in the, in the autumn if you get a chance. <laughs> um, so it's been a long kind of development for me. I, uh, I went to China in 1979. I helped to open the CBS News Bureau. And, uh, but what I've, been, what I've been thinking about is evolution. I, after a long time in the news, I started to think about how the earth formed and it was a molten rock surrounded by poisonous gases. And then over prodigious time, it was converted by biological life. And it's interesting because our religious cosmologies, they all say that, the, that human beings emerged in paradise. And if I look at evolution, and I consider that there's a photoreactive biochemical reaction that converts sunlight and water and nutrients into life, and that this respirates and obviously created an oxygenated atmosphere and a fully functional freshwater system and fertile soils and tremendous biodiversity. It seems to me that in evolutionary terms, human beings emerged in paradise. So I think that's why we don't I don't find a difference between the religious cosmologies and, and evolution. And I think it's, if we understand that, we, that human beings emerged under a canopy, and that canopy was providing us with microclimates, and the, the, the height of the canopy, the percentages and total amounts of organic and well biomass and then the, to, the percentages and total amounts of accumulating organic matter are really important. And human beings only emerged in, in relationship to geologic and evolutionary time in the very last few moments. And in this, in this scenario, we began to have some impacts when we learned how to hunt. And we learned how to hunt probably by studying some other, other species who hunt in packs. And we became very good at this. And one of our first impacts was to, to take out megafauna. And we started to reduce and change biodiversity. This is cheating. This is just a cheetah nursing in the wild so that you'll like me. <laughs> um, but when we started to take out biodiversity, we started to change the predator-prey relationships, which changes habitat. But about 10 to 12,000 years ago, we, we began to do some other things, and these were more impactful. This is what it looks like when you take the door off a helicopter. I highly recommend this, but also take gaffer's tape and make sure that you're taped in because it's a little bit nerve wracking to do this. But you never, you never have to worry uh, about being excited because it's very exciting. And I put it here to show you the power of nature. The natural systems are so incredibly powerful and when you go out there and you look for them, on every continent you can find that the evolutionary systems, the natural systems exist and there's nothing we can do to, to destroy them 
We can interrupt them for a short while, but if we do that, we're going to actually come to a point where we collapse those systems, and then what's in danger is our civilization, not the natural systems. So nature's not in trouble, human beings are in trouble. And if, if human beings are removed from, from the, the, the equation, nature and the natural evolutionary systems and, and, and uh, processes will reassert themselves and there will ultimately be an evolutionary outcome. So my conclusion in my research is that human beings emerged in paradise. But in the cosmologies, it says human beings sinned and were expelled from paradise. So we might want to think about what does that mean? And 10 to 12,000 years ago, human beings began to do settled agriculture. And when they did this, from a, from a scientific perspective, you can say they reduced biodiversity, they reduced biomass, and they reduced the accumulation of organic matter. And this altered gas exchange by reducing photosynthesis. So there was less oxygen release and less carbon sequestration. And it changed the nutrient release from microbial communities taking nutrients from geologic materials and making them available to biological life. And it massively altered the infiltration and retention of rainfall and moisture. So the hydrological cycle was disrupted. And in all the, um, all the cradles of civilization, this happened. And in, in any of the places where this happened, the civilizations that emerged, they failed. Now, what's Im important to realize about this is we're starting to see similar types of outcomes through climate changes and biodiversity loss and toxicity and, and, uh, and desertification. And what, what we have to realize is that now our civilizations are planetary. And so in the past, the civilization could move on to some place else. And, but now we, we have totally populated the Earth, so we are endangering global systems. So in 1979, I went overseas. I helped to open the CBS News Bureau, um, and I covered geopolitical events like the rise of China from poverty and isolation. I don't know if you remember Tiananmen, where the uh, very serious things. I've covered um, international terrorism, the collapse of the Soviet Union, stories like that. But in in doing that, something happened because in 1995 I was asked by the World Bank to go and uh, film a baseline study and this was the baseline study for the Luz Plateau Watershed Rehabilitation Project. If you've ever heard of me it's probably because of this work um, unless you're a news freak and you you were interested in those those things but the Luz Plateau, when I was asked to go to the Luz Plateau in 1995, I, I found that this was an example of a, a cradle of civilization that had been fundamentally ecologically destroyed. And it, it was very interesting to me because in comparison with the geopolitical events I'd been covering, I found that this was more interesting and more important ultimately. This is Luz. Luz is a, a, a um, geomorphological soil. It's caused by glacial movements in the Himalayas and deposited by wind on the plateau. And because this is the cradle of civilization for the Chinese race, if you dig around in there, you might find some rather interesting things, which he may discover here in just a moment. Dig a little more. Okay. So, you know, this was the place where the early Chinese 
civilizations began. The Han, the Qin, the Tang dynasties were in this place. This is to the southwest, and it's a fully functional system. And this is what it looked like in 1995 when I went to the Lus Plateau. So how do you do that? How do you take a fully functional system, which is the birthplace of the largest ethnic group on the planet, and turn it into this ruin? I, I went there and I knew nothing about this. But I, I looked at this and in comparison with the geopolitical things, I thought, this is more important. This is what we're left with. Generations in the future are never going to remember Brezhnev or any of this other stuff uh, that's going on. They're going to be left with the decisions, the consciousness that we hold and the choices that we make in understanding about this. So I started to study this. And it's now been over 20 years that I've been studying this. And it turns out that when you start to study, you, you gradually learn a little bit more. And so in, in this place, there was virtually no vegetative cover at all. And you, if you didn't have a baseline and you looked at it and you said, well, this is a desert, but actually, it's not really a desert. It's, a, it's, a, it's an area that has been degraded by human beings. And so it's very similar to the Mediterranean, to North Africa, to the Sahel, to many areas in Central Asia, and growing more and more in Central America and South America. So, and, and to some extent in North America. So if we, if we understand this, the, the, the other part of this is that the, the people in this area were desperately poor. And China has been changing in recent time. So they were the poorest people. And somehow the government in China said, well, we can't have the rest of the East Coast and the manufacturing areas become wealthy and leave these people in misery out there. So they really wanted to do something to help in, in the area. And they also had a really enormous problem because when you have such a, a situation, it causes enormous disruptions to natural systems. And so you have poverty. That's clearly apparent that the people are desperately poor and they're barely eking out a living. And actually, their activities are making the situation worse. But in order to understand this, the Chinese dispatched, like, a large number of scientists. And the World Bank had hired me to go out and, and, and document this. So I learned quite a lot, and I got to hang out with the scientists. Now, when we came to this place in the Lois Plateau the first time, we were all really shocked. You know, we thought, oh my god. You know, well, how can, how can ever anybody try to rehabilitate an, an area that is so huge and so fundamentally destroyed ecologically and the truth is we spent two years working with the local people with the farmers with the local officials with the, with the experts in the various fields of hydrology soil water conservation forestry agriculture environment try to understand what it would take to do something like this and after two years we still didn't have many answers the world bank didn't have the answer and the local people didn't have the answer and we spent another year and a half talking to the farmers in the villages, trying to understand what they had done in the past 20 or 30 years that was successful. And it was really interesting, not much was there to show, because the current practices at that time were just not sustainable at all. Well, you know, that is Jürgen Fogela. He designed the I intervention for the World Bank, so he's a pretty important fellow. And this is what it looked like. And, you know, there's virtually no vegetation. And hydrologically speaking, what, what you have is, if the water comes down and hits a canopy, it has a certain dynamic. But if you've removed the vegetation, 
then it's really the kinetic energy that, that is so powerful. So you, you're really losing the water and you're losing your soils. And, you know, over millennia, human beings have not actually taken this on, that this is the basis of our atmosphere, of our hydrological cycle, of climate regulation, of biodiversity. And when we allow this to degrade, then it leads to just ultimately to this collapse scenario. And we've been going that way repeatedly, and we've been in, in um, primitive societies, this would be uh, like um, slash and burn. But now we're doing the same things as slash and burn, but we're mechanizing it so we can actually destroy faster. And, uh, and the, the impacts are, are enormous. And I think a number of people are talking about this all over the world, that it's, it's really our consciousness that has to increase. Because when we are fully conscious of what's happening, we can make different choices. So from this scenario, the World Bank, the Chinese government, decided they were going to completely change the situation. No one could really believe this. It, it, it was a, like a fantastic idea, but everybody thought it was sort of, you know. Anyway, we made a film called Hope in a Changing Climate that was broadcast at the time of Copenhagen on the BBC. So basically, we started documenting in 1995. And we watched all of the processes. So they, they had to change their policy, because the policy was allowing for unsustainable agricultural practices. All of those were made illegal. So you couldn't do the things which you'd, everybody had been doing there. So they had to substitute behaviors. So they had to train everybody in new behaviors. And they, they used participatory mechanisms to communicate what was going on. And they used another method which was very successful. They paid them. <laughs> that, that works very well. And uh, so by, by paying them to, to learn and to give them the basis of a new sustainable agricultural systems, they got them all to participate and ultimately the, the outcomes and the harvest belong to the people. So this was a fairly enlightened and, and rather dramatic thing. This is actually um, a, a type of water storage mechanism or water capture uh, called terracing. But it's not a terracing project, it's just a, it's an integrated project. So terraces are part of this. Um, other types of things, gabions, meanders, check dams, all sorts of water management. But then also propagation and plant out and the substitution of perennials for annuals and an understanding, a growing understanding of polycultures as opposed to monocultures and to some extent a growing understanding of the relationship between ecological landscapes and productive agricultural landscapes. So 
it, there is a lot of complexity. There is quite a lot to study. It's quite interesting to follow the methodologies. The goal was to give a hat to the hilltops, give a belt to the hills as well as shoes at the base. The hat meant that the top of these hills had to be replanted with trees. The belt meant that terraces had to be built to be used for crop planting and also for trees. The shoes were the dams which we had to build so that the hills could grow back to life and our economy as well as our lives could improve. When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. Well, this is, for me, was extremely important because I started to realize in our economic systems, the ecological systems are zero. It's only the products which we extract which are given value. This is fundamentally wrong. So we have a fundamental error in logic at the basis of global economics. And it's, it's, it's fairly dramatic when you, when you start to understand what this means. So I think a lot of people are talking about paradigm shifts and that we need this. We absolutely must come to grips with this because what you find out is we have created a perverse incentive to degrade the ecosystems by valuing the derivatives higher than the source of life. And you don't get another result until you figure this out. So the other thing that we saw is it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. This is a realization that is almost a responsibility. So the fact that we can restore these areas means that we actually must restore these areas. So if we don't, we're not processing what we understand scientifically, and we're not, I mean, we, we have choice. We have free will. The science is concurring with all this. So now the science basically has taken on the fact that we can restore large-scale damaged ecosystems. We understand a lot about this. And then the policy has now taken this on. So it's written into our policies. An interesting part of this is that the economy is much larger <laughs> in a natural functional system than it is in the system that we're using now. So we're, we're saying that scarcity is the basis of wealth, but in this thinking, it's, it's abundance that's the basis of wealth. And I think we also need to learn to share, um, and this is, this is a little uh, different. But so this thinking, is now relatively mature. In 2006, I was given an, a, a fellowship by the Rothamsted International uh, Research Institute, which turns out to be Malthusian <laughs> um, because they started in 1850s. But I was sent to Africa, and in Africa, I presented in, in, to a number of places. Rwanda was one where um, they really took this seriously. And Rwanda, if you remember, had a genocide in 1994, and 850,000 people were killed in, in 100 days. Many things that I've seen in Rwanda remind me of some of the things that I've seen in China. 
The Chinese government was asking this generation and all the generations alive today to change the course of human history, to take those denuded, the denuded landscape that they, they had and somehow alter this. Well, this is a letter that says thank you for sharing that. That's really nice. But they also sent me another letter that says we, un we believe you and we're rewriting our land use policy laws to, uh, to connect economic development to ecological function. There's 10 years of data now. This is uh, from two years ago. We are giving ourselves maybe three years of growth so that by 2020 we have 30% of actually forested area. So there's now did an aggressive campaign across the country to restore destroyed forests. There has been a lot of restoration that has been carried out uh, relating to our environment. And we've seen that restoration grow from year to another year. We have um, a target of increasing our electricity generation. Today we are at uh, about 97 megawatts and we want to increase that to 1,000 megawatts in the next eight years. Uh, and we are targeting that about 80% or so of that source of energy should be renewable energy, mainly from hydropower uh, electricity and from geothermal. So from 2014, we want to be producing any electricity from fossil fuels. Because as individual smallholders, they have no hope of accessing markets at all. So we've, we, we took up the policy of land conservation to ensure that. And we've been successful at that. It, we started it four years ago and we have, we, we as Rwanda now, today we are very proud to say we are food secure. We've been growing at an average of 8.2%. And we've seen more than one million people of population lifted out of poverty in the last five years. That's 12% of our, of our population. And we've achieved this within this mode of growth that caters for environment as well. So that's pretty dramatic because if you consider the 8.2% economic growth is happening in a global depression while the rest of the world is, is either flat or going negative. So th this also has other implications because Rwanda is the headwaters of the White Nile and the Congo rivers. So if you, if you degrade the hydrological systems uh, there, it affects the entire continent. So kind of getting our mind around the scale, I'm the ecosystem ambassador for a foundation called Common Land. And the Common Land Foundation was started by a colleague and friend of mine who I, I spoke in Sweden in, in 2009. Uh, I spoke after Gro Harlem Brundtland, if you know who that is, the former Prime Minister of Norway, the former director of the World Health Organization, and the author of the Brundtland Report, which is the first time that sustainable development was mentioned in global policy, global di uh, diplomatic policy. But the Common Land Foundation has been working on uh, developing a transitional economic model, which is based on four returns. So the, the idea is not to have just return on investment. The world, once there was plenty of space, but the population is rapidly increasing and people are consuming more and more. That has a big impact on our environment and ecosystems. A quarter of the once fertile land on Earth is now dust and sand as a result of human activity. The quality of our future depends on our ability to change these developments. The good news is it can be done with landscape restoration. That's more than just the recovery of land because a landscape is also a community. People can revitalize an area an economy that restores and uses the landscape with sustainable business cases. That's the goal.
It all begins with inspiration, with a new future perspective for all those involved and a common plan for restoration of the landscape. From this, jobs are created, and that leads to social bonding and, for example, education and security. Restoration also leads to the return of natural capital, such as biodiversity, fertile land, water, and a stable climate. That attracts financial capital, first as an investment, later as a return. This is what we call the four returns. Return of inspiration, return of social capital, return of natural capital, and return of financial capital. To achieve these four returns, we develop three landscape zones. A natural zone in which biodiversity is restored and maintained. A combined zone, which is rehabilitated with farmers working the land. And an economic zone for sustainable business activity. It takes an average of 20 years, in other words, a generation to restore a landscape. If we start now, we will create the basis for a different world. This is what inspires us. Well, this is getting quite a lot of support. Um, and we have already got uh, about projects covering about a million hectares in Spain, uh, South Africa, and Australia. And there's more discussion about how this can grow. Um, this is something that we're, we're also working, that I would say the common land concept is pretty capital intensive. It's trying to move uh, capital formations toward restoration. And we're trying in another direction to bring participation from people from all over the world. So we're building ecosystem restoration camps uh, and an ecosystem restoration cooperative. And this is where we want to have dinner together um, in the camps. So I hope you'll all go to camp. We want to have the best yurts. It's a little bit like glamping, we hope. Um, so we don't want to be in a, in a uh, we want to teach consistently there. So there'll be uh, introductory, intermediate, and advanced training going on in these places. And there'll be restoration at scale. So we will be able to build very large uh, propagation units, we'll be able to grow soils, we'll be able to do both ecosystem restoration and regenerative agriculture and train the largest number of people in, in these things. So that's basically what I wanted to say and, and if, you, if you'd like to join the uh, ecosystem restoration cooperative, um, you know, there, learn more about it and, and welcome to join that. We have now 550 members of the cooperative, but we're going to go up to 1,000 before we build the first camp in Andalusia in Spain. We've got many uh, requests for more camps in different parts of the world. There's going to be a horizontal kind of uh, governance both of the cooperative and of the camps. So uh, it's kind of a way to have a sacred space or a safe space where we can have profound conversations, live and work together for short times or medium length times or longer times and learn together and have this discussion on a continuous basis because this, I believe, is the great work of our time. This is what we're required to do in all the generations that are alive today, have got to figure out how to move human civilization toward a sustainable pathway. And we need to do that while having fun. And uh, so I like camping and I like uh, gardening. So. We can garden and camp. We're also talking about building everything in the camps ourselves. So we're gonna go in first with, um, with uh, craft uh, shops for woodworking and for metalworking so we can fabricate everything in the shops. And we're gonna to try to do things, we're discussing things like banning plastics 
so that we can see what it's like in a post-carbon uh, world, a post-fossil fuel world. And um, I think that it's just a safe space in the camps and we can go to some of the most degraded places on the earth and we can actually work every day for a little while. We're, we're, we're also talking about limiting work to about five hours a day and uh, having a lot of music and self-study and recreation and culture and three good organic meals every day. So, uh, and to, to you know, have a kind of equality so there won't be really much class divisions within the camps, people will come. And we think this could also, um, it, it could affect the migrant situation, it could affect the post-traumatic stress disorder veterans who are coming back from, and it could certainly um, work together with some of the disaster areas. So anyway, that's, I, I think I'll stop here and we'll have a conversation.